Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or message or letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. No, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Now, we are going to be speaking of the man of lawlessness this morning. And so if you recognize Craig in this, you probably are right on target. And you'll notice that he stepped out of the room before I said that. This is a very interesting and much debated passage in Scripture, one of the more difficult uh, passages regarding Paul's writings. In fact, the great uh, early church father named Augustine said, I confess that I'm entirely ignorant of what he means to say. So if the great Augustine, who wrote so much and was such a powerful intellect, had difficulty in understand this, understanding this passage, certainly we'll have a little difficulty ourselves. Leon Morris, who just died uh, a couple weeks ago, is one of my favorite evangelical scholars. He wrote in his commentary on the Thessalonian epistles that this is a quote notoriously difficult passage consequently I'm going to be presenting a view on this that I hope that you will take and listen to and consider that you look up some of the biblical references I have in your outline there and perhaps be persuaded by but I do admit that this is a difficult passage so I'm not going to pretend that I am a know-it-all in this passage as if I were a know-it-all in any other passage. Now, despite popular opinion, I do believe that if some of the details might be difficult for us, I do believe that despite popular opinion, that I can demonstrate sufficiently well that this passage, this prophecy regarding the man of lawlessness is not a prophecy that's in our future, but it refers to events that are well in our past and has already transpired, and I hope to show that as I get into it. Some of you were at the Revelation discussion uh, yesterday and the day before, and you will remember that I pointed out that Revelation has uh, already been fulfilled because it uh, referred to the destruction of the temple in AD 70 and the, the cessation of the old covenant economy, the removal of the Judaic approach to God for the establishment of the Christian approach to God. Well, as is so often in the case when we're studying biblical passages, it is important for us to look at the historical setting. The New Testament letters are often called occasional epistles. That is, that means that they were occasioned by some circumstance in the life of the church. Generally, the occasional epistles are not just uh, generic platitudes but they're responding to particular issues that the, the uh, churches are facing. Think of the Corinthian epistles where they talk about the man who had his own uh, uh, father's wife for his own wife and all of these various things, this argument about who's of Paul, who's of Apollos and all of that. That doesn't go on in the church universal. That's something particular for that church at Corinth. So it's an occasional epistle written upon a certain occasion and in a certain need. Well, the same thing is true of the Thessalonian epistles. Consequently, it's very important for us that we understand the historical setting of an occasional epistle. Otherwise, we'll just bypass the reality of the situation and develop our own thoughts about it without reference to what's really going on in the region. Now, to give you a little historical bearing about where the Thessalonian epistles arose and when they arose, we, uh, you could look up Acts 17 through 18. This is a very important historical setting, and I'll just summarize it briefly for you. Paul was in Thessalonica, ministering to the people there, and in Acts 17 and 18, he leaves Thessalonica, he goes to Berea, ministers there for a while, then goes to Athens and just for a little while, and then he goes on to Corinth where he stays for 18 months. It's while he is at Corinth that he writes the first and second epistles uh, to the Thessalonians. 
And this background is very important. When we look at the historical setting, we're going to see, as is so often in the New Testament, the historical background shows a Jewish opposition to the uh, budding Christian faith. And this Jewish opposition is going to affect how we understand uh, the man of lawlessness passage here. For instance, in Acts 17 verses 1 through 3, Paul preaches that Jesus is the Messiah the Jews were expecting. Well, instead of accepting this, as you well know from your general understanding of New Testament history, the Jews are riled to mob action. In fact, Paul escapes, but in Acts 17, verses 6 through 7, we read, when they, the Jews, did not find them, that is Paul and the others with him, they, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all teach or act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. So the Jews are trying to use the Roman authorities to get at the Christians, saying these people are turning the world upside down. They're teaching that there's another king other than Caesar. They are a political threat. And that's, that's what's happening to the Christians back then. But the authorities release Jason and his uh, kin. Then the Jews follow Paul to Berea. In Acts 17, 13, same chapter, a few verses later, we read, But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there likewise, agitating and stirring up the crowds. The Jews are vehemently opposed to the Christian declaration that Jesus is the Messiah, and they're following around the leading Christians, causing them trouble wherever they go. Well, Paul then goes from Berea to Athens, where he's there just a brief time, and then on to Corinth, where he stays for 18 months. You can read about that in Acts chapter 18. Now remember, he wrote the first and second epistles to the Thessalonians while at Corinth. Well, what's going on in Corinth while he writes these letters? In Acts 18 too, upon arriving in Corinth, we read, Paul found a certain Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius, that's the emperor, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Now why had Claudius commanded that all the Jews leave Rome at this time? Well, it seems obvious to historical and um, biblical scholars that the Jews were driven out of Rome because of the riots being caused by the Jews in uh, agitating against the Christians. The Roman biographer Suetonius, who lived, uh, who wrote about A.D. 140, not too long after the New Testament era, uh, is, records what's going on. He says in his book, quote, as the Jews were indulging in constant riots at the instigation of Crestus, Claudius banished them from Rome. Uh, Roman authorities tell us that this is the, the Latin way of referring to Christ. There are riots being caused because of the name of Crestus, that is Christ, and because of that the Emperor Claudius drove the Jews out because they're causing so many riots and so much trouble. So again, Paul is being chased around by the Jews from city to city. He goes to Corinth, he meets up with Priscilla and Aquila who have had to leave Rome because they're Jewish converts to Christ. They've had to leave Rome because the Emperor is sick of the Jews causing trouble regarding Christ. And in Corinth, the Jews again are angered. In Acts 18.6 we read, When they resisted and blasphemed, Paul shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I shall go to the Gentiles. And then in verse 12, Now when Gallio was proconsul, proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat constantly agitating, constantly seeking to get Paul in trouble with the legal authorities of Rome. Because of this, because of all this Jewish antagonism, because of their chasing him from city to city, because of the danger they're presenting Paul with um, uh, imprisonment to Rome, etc., Paul uses very hostile language against the Jews, and he even equates them with Satan. Now, I'm going to read this in 1 Thessalonians 2, but remember, what did Jesus say in John 8, 44 to the, to the Jews? You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Remember, Jesus sees in 
apostate Judaism, a resistance to him that is so satanically inspired that he says, you're of your father the devil. They always claim we're of our father Abraham. Jesus says, no, you're of your father the devil. And John in Revelation 2.9 and 3.9 talks about those who call themselves Jews but are really of the synagogue of Satan. And so the Bible has some very strong words to say about apostate Judaism. Well, Paul's doing that here in 1 Thessalonians 2. Th this is 1 Thessalonians. He says in verses 14 through 16, as he writes to the Thessalonians, For you became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hand of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. And notice what he says of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. Remember all that history I just gave you. He's saying the Jews killed Jesus and they're driving us out everywhere we go. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. With the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Skipping down to verse 18. He says, Therefore we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan thwarted us. He has just said the Jews have hindered him from doing his ministry. And then he says, I wanted to come to you again, but Satan thwarted us. Notice the thwarting of the Jews Paul associates with the activity of Satan. Now in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 2, right after our text that we'll be studying, Paul prays for deliverance from perverse and evil men. Given the history in Acts 17 and 18, given the comments of Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2, it is clear that these evil and perverse men are the Jewish people who are resisting the gospel, who both killed our Lord Jesus Christ and drove us out. Now, that's what's going on back then. That's the historical backdrop to this occasional epistle, this epistle written to a people for a particular reason. That's very important for us to understand who the man of lawlessness is and what it's all about. Now I'm going to deviate from the notes here. As I was looking over the notes this morning, I thought, no, I might, I might do something a little different. So I'm going, to, I'm going to give you something that's not in your notes, but it does show up later at the conclusion, but I thought it'd be helpful here to brace you for my understanding of the man of lawlessness. Despite the fact that this passage is often projected into our future, something that is coming in the last days at the very end, just before the rapture or whatever, the text itself clearly gives us information that demands that the prophecy be something current to the day in which Paul wrote. And I'm going to give you four evidences that Paul is writing about something that is currently going on and is about to come to pass and therefore it's 2,000 years in our past. Notice verse 4. In verse 4 he says of the man of lawlessness that he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes a seat in the temple of God. What is the temple of God? That is the temple. And it's, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. So this has to have reference to something going on prior to the destruction in AD 70. The temple of God has not been rebuilt since the year 70. So that's evidence that Paul is dealing with an issue that has some sort of reference to the temple of God which was still standing at that time. Furthermore, secondly, notice verse 6. Notice it says, and you know what restrains him now. Paul is writing about the man of lawlessness being presently restrained. Is that restraint going on for 2,000 more years? So the man of lawlessness is being presently restrained while Paul writes. And to me, it's a great stretch of uh, understanding to say, and it still is being restrained 2,000 years later. Furthermore, thirdly, Noticing also in verse 6, he says, You know what restrains him. The Thessalonians knew what was restraining this man of lawlessness. So it's something... Oh, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians 2. Um, the man of lawlessness was something they knew about. Now what in the world, how could they know the man of lawlessness is if he's coming 2,000 years in the future? So not only was he being restrained in their time frame, they knew 
the man of lawlessness. And then finally, notice verse 7. He says, the, uh, the mystery, well, let me read verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. This man of lawlessness, somehow in a mystery form, is already at work. Paul is dealing with contemporary issues relevant to that era. 